Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, please forgive my voice, it's a little scratchy today. Um, my name is Charles Ziegler, I'm the faculty director for the Guadalmeyer <coughs> World Order Award, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you uh, our 2019 Guadalmeyer World Order Award winners. First, I have a few uh, pleasant tasks to do. I would like to recognize, first of all, the Grawmeyer family uh, who come in to visit us. If they would just stand briefly or wave their hands. First, it was Charlie Grawmeyer, whose generosity made this uh, award possible. It is the largest award in the field of political science and international relations. Uh, some other people to recognize, uh, executive director of the awards, uh, Charlie Leonard is here. Okay. I don't see her dean of arts and sciences, Kimberly Kemp Leonard, is she here? She couldn't be here, all right. Um, I'd also like to recognize the chair of political science, uh, Dr. Jasmine Ferrier. And I would also like to thank the uh, members of the Department of Political Science Grawmeyer Committee. If you wave your arms, those of you who are here. <laughs> General Williams, who's helped administer the award, and uh, Brooke Ryder. I think they're both somewhere else either. No, but I would like to thank them. They helped make the award possible through their hard work. This award goes through a number of stages. It takes virtually a year to choose uh, a winner. And the uh, sort of the high point of this is a distinguished international jury of the very top people in the field who uh, look over the, the awards, uh, the various books. And I want to just read a little to you about what they wrote about this book. Uh, the book, Fulfilling Social and Economic Rights by Fukuda Parr, Lawson, Reamer, and Randolph, was unanimously rated by the jury as the best candidate for the Grawmeyer World Order Award. The authors advance a new index for measuring countries' progressive achievement of social and economic rights, the Social and Economic Rights uh, Fulfillment Index. The authors list six major categories of social and economic rights derived from the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1967 International Covenant on Economic cultural, and social rights, food, health, education, housing, work, and social security. Their addition of the criteria of countries' resource constraints, the achievement, possibilities, frontier, is original and likely to be highly influential. The APF acknowledges that countries vary in levels of development, and not all can be held to the same standard as the higher income countries. The index would be highly useful to potential developmental assistance donors and international organizations charged with assisting development. The SERF, or SERF index, could also be used to guide policy initiatives by the countries themselves. Through their index, Fukuda Par et al. are able to test policy questions such as whether increasing government spending necessarily improves public health the potential impact of gender equality on other aspects of development, and the role of democracy in enhancing realization of social and economic rights. Thus, the SURF Index is both a useful tool and a feasible method of improving world order. That's high praise indeed. Now, let me introduce to you each of our winners. Uh, this year, we have three winners since uh, they co-authored the book together. Sakiko Fukuda Par. She is the director of the Julian J. Studley Graduate Programs in International Affairs and Professor of International Affairs at the New School. Her teaching and research are focused on human rights and development, global health and global goal setting, and governance by indicators. From 1995 to 2004, she was lead author and director of the UN Development Program, Human Development Reports. Her recent publication, most recently, uh, is Millennium Development Goals, Ideas, Interests, and Influence. Fukuda Park contributes ac 
effectively to international policy and research processes. Most recent appointments include the UN Committee on Development Policy as Vice Chair, the Secretary General's High Level Panel on Access to Medicines and Innovation, and Boards of Knowledge Ecology International and International Association for Feminist Economics. She directs the Independent Panel on Global Governance for Health at the University of Oslo in Norway, and also serves as Distinguished Fellow at the JICA Research Institute in Tokyo. Tara Lawson Reamer. Founder and managing partner of Catalyst Project, specializing in the development of innovative public policies, social change strategies, and high impact organizations. She's also a faculty fellow at the University of California, San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, and a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Dr. Lawson Reamer served as senior advisor at the U.S. Department of the Treasury during the Obama administration, where she worked on emerging economies in fragile states. She joined Treasury wildly from the New School for Social Research, where she was an assistant professor for international affairs and founding chair of the university's advisory committee on investor responsibility, implementing one of the nation's first institutional climate change divestment policies. Susan Randolph, <laughs> is Associate Professor Emerita in the Department of Economics at the University of Connecticut, where she also served as faculty affiliate of the Human Rights Institute. Uh, El Instituto, Institute of Latin America, Caribbean, and Latin American Studies, the India Studies Program, and the Asian and Asian American <laughs> Studies Institute at UConn. Dr. Randolph is co-founder of the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, a co-director of the Economic and Social Rights Empowerment Initiative, co-chair of Yukon Human Rights Institute's Economic and Social Rights Research Program, and currently serves on the Gladstein Commission of the HRI. Dr. Randolph has served as short-term consultant to the Office of the High Commission on Human Rights, the World Bank, and U.S. Agency for International Development. Prior to coming to UConn, she worked for four years as head of the Program Development Division uh, with a Turkish grassroots development organization that enables poor, landless households to establish viable, self-sustaining economic enterprises. Dr. Randolph's research is focused on a broad range of issues in development economics, including poverty, inequality, food security, and economic and social rights at both the country and regional level. This is the book, Fulfilling Social and Economic Rights. I think I've been here far too long. I'm going to turn it over to our 2019 Guamire World Order Award winners. Well, thank you very much for this lovely um, introduction. And uh, I think I speak for all three of us when we say how amazing it is to be here. We feel extremely privileged and honored um, by this award and to be with you here today to share the, um, the ideas in this, in this book. Um, so I'll um, start with explaining why, what, what the, um, why we, ha we wrote this book and, and what it's about. Human rights economic, social, cultural, civil, and political, secure fundamental conditions necessary for a life of dignity and freedom. <clears throat> and, and this is freedom from fear and freedom from want. Surely this is one of the most important political projects for countries and for international cooperation of the 20th, 20th century. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights articulated human rights norms as, quote, a common standard of achievement of all people in all nations. And what's most important is that it, it also pledged, I mean, in this document, governments that adopted it pledged to, quote, promote respect, <coughs> promote respect for those freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, 
secure their universal and effective recogni recognition and observance. This comes from the preamble of the Universal Declaration. And the human rights movement surely is, in fact, one of the most important legacies of the last century. So having adopted that and having made those commitments, how have we progressed uh, since uh, 1948 when the Universal Declaration was adopted? Have states actually lived up to their commitments? Their commitment to do the most, to do their utmost to secure freedom from fear and freedom from want. This book seeks to answer those questions. The purpose is so that we can hold governments to account for the commitments that they made, but also to understand how the what, how we, and and in what way, um, the progress with the realization of human rights can be advanced. We actually know rather little about uh, what advances human rights. For example, it is often assumed that democracies guarantee rights. But we see many democratic governments, which just doesn't quite live up to that uh, commentary, that, that, that assumption. Socialist governments during the 20th century claim that they promoted economic and social rights more successfully than capitalist regimes. Others have argued that free markets are better at delivering freedom from fear, as well as freedom from want. It is also frequently assumed that economic prosperity is a guarantee of human rights. <clears throat> a more rigorous study based on robust methodology and empirical evidence is needed to answer these questions. We need to look carefully at country performance and look beyond broad generalizations as uh, like those that I have just quoted. So our book develops a framework of analysis and, and, and a measurement tool, the SURF index, that is capable of tracking progress and regress, identifies, ad, identifying strong and weak performance, and exploring policy relevant questions. The index is limited to economic and social rights, the rights to education, health, food, housing, social security, and decent work. The SURF index provides a quantitative yardstick against which to judge country progress in pro providing economic and social right, rights essential for <clears throat> to human dignity and can facilitate the identification of the kinds of economic institutions, policies, and practices that translate economic resources into human flourishing. It looks at the performance of governments against their commitment to the UDHR and other international legal agreements to do their utmost to, now I can't know how to, how do I change, can't, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I can't change my, uh, my text, but I'll have another way of doing this. Thank you, sorry, sorry about this. Um, so our index looks at how countries have performed in translating uh, their economic resources into human freedoms. And that is flipping the question that is most often used in, ass in assessing progress, which is to ask how is a country doing by promoting the process of material production. We ask what material production can do. Now, the reason why there is no measure of human rights progress is not for lack of trying. Since the 1970s, numerous efforts have been made to develop performance assessment methods. The first generation of these efforts were limited to civil and political rights. And since the 1990s, the second generation of efforts broadened, were, ha, have been broadened to include socioeconomic rights. But all of these uh, efforts did not lead to a creation of a methodology nor a data set in socioeconomic rights. And many of the methodologies that were proposed, developed, were pro problematic for a variety of reasons. First, uh, they started by a conceptual analysis, unpacking the right to different attributes or features and measuring each one in what, what could be considered to be a sort of a categorical approach. This led to an overwhelming list of indicators. For example, one project in the field of education 
developed a list of more than 200 indicators to measure progress with the right to education. Well, obviously, that is very impractical because it's just an overwhelming amount of work to generate, collect data, publish them, and an, an overwhelming amount of information for the mind to process. You can't sort of get an overview of whether things are improving or, or not, or how big the problem is. These earlier um, methods, the other methods, focus on violations. Um, but duties of states with respect to human rights are not just to not violate, not just to respect rights. They're also to protect and also to fulfill. Some of these methodologies also assume that socioeconomic outcome indicators, right, literacy rate or being at school, school enrollment, are a measure of performance. But they do not consider the resources available that different countries have in a world in which you can have per capita income of $5,000 or $50,000. And most importantly, many of these so-called measures, quantitative measures, are actually based on subjective data, opinion, expert opinion, or reports. And they turn this qualitative assessment into quantitative numbers. And a lot of, there's a lot of mistrust of these data because they are produced by organizations with economic and political interests and therefore are suspected of being biased in this field which is filled with controversy. That is, human rights is a very controversial issue. Now, freedom from want may be taken for granted by many but are frequently and systematically denied to much of humanity. About 11 million ch ch children die before the age of five, equivalent, in fact, to 29,000 a day. But most shockingly, 70% of these are from causes that could have been prevented. So this is where state obligation comes in, that you can prevent a premature child death, but you don't. So this is essentially the issue of the violation of human rights and the failure to fulfill rights. So such data may imply that socioeconomic rights are a challenge in low-income countries. But we know that the struggle for freedom from want is in all countries. In myriad forms, social and economic <coughs> rights, denials, and abuses occur daily. From dangerous work, work, uh, work on construction sites in New York City, inadequate schooling in rural South Africa, elevated risks of cancer due to dumping of hazardous wastes in Buenos Aires, and so on. The economic poverty of these households and countries is a convenient explanation for these situations. But in fact, these situations arise from public policies and public neglect, such as the inadequate priority given to providing essential public goods or the regulation of environmental waste. They also arise from discrimination that denies economic and social opportunities and voice to poor and marginalized groups. Human rights is a struggle that is ongoing across the world regardless of the level of income. And in the 21st century, we face new forms of threats to socioeconomic rights and new, new types of institutions and policies. Margot Solomon, who directs the Human Rights Center at the London School of Economics, remarked that major function of human rights is, quote, to take the negative forces and tendencies of the current econ global economic system. And Kuhneman, an activist, remarks, economic, social, and cultural rights are the only means of self-defense for millions of impoverished and marginalized individuals and groups all over the world. These are playing an increasing role in the way that grassroots organizations in many parts of the world see their struggles. Globalization and liberalization of markets have created enormous um, wealth and opportunities, but have simultaneously brought threats to security and subsistence for many. Investments to build dams bring energy to people, farms, factories, but they d dislocate local communities, upending livelihoods and cultural moor moorings. Trade reduces prices and expands consumer choice, create new jobs, but displaces others. 
Financial flows expand access to capital for poor countries, but create volatility that can cause havoc in financial ma markets. So these are all the reasons why economic and social rights are as much of a challenge and a struggle today as um, we have ever had. Um, I did not use uh, my slides, but I just want to show this, which is an encapsulation of Eleanor Roosevelt holding up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1949. The struggles of that, that are going on every day around the world as people mobilize to claim their rights. And a book by Amartya Sen, who argues that human rights are essentially a set of ethical claims. A lot of people think that they are simply a set of laws. They are laws, but they're essentially ethical claims. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn over to Tara, who is going to explain in greater detail um, what the uh, SURF index, how the SURF index is constructed. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is my mic on? Nope. Can you hear me now? Now. Can you hear me now? Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Sukiko, for uh, the introduction of the, of the work and the concept. Um, as my colleague explained, the SURF Index is grounded in international human rights law. And these are the core legal instruments that we looked at and relied upon in constructing the index itself. The UDHR, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, et cetera. These rights offer an important yardstick for measuring human progress. If by progress we mean not simply rising material production and consumption, but improving human well-being and the real freedoms that people enjoy. So together, taken together, these legal instruments spell out a list of six core social and economic rights that give substantive meaning to the abstract notion of human freedom. Right to food, right to health, right to education, right to housing, right to work, and right to social security. Crucially, within the framework of international human rights law, citizens are the rights holders and states are the duty bearers. Human rights norms are binding on state signatories to the various human rights covenants. The fulfillment of human rights, therefore, must be evaluated by reference to both the level of rights enjoyment by rights holders and the level of the duty-bearing state's compliance with their obligations. The SURF index, therefore, differs fundamentally from other social progress indices like the Human Development Index, because it considers both rights holders and duty bearers. For example, while the US scores third overall in the HDI, it's number 20 among high-income OECD countries on the SURF Index. Uruguay is only 51% overall on the HDI, but can, comes in third on the SURF Index. And we will, um, as we unpack how the SURF Index is constructed, you will see why this is the case. <coughs> what is this obligation? What is this duty of states? The various ESR covenants reiterate that countries are obligated to progressively fulfill rights to the maximum of available resources. This, quote, progressive realization formulation of states' legal obligations is fundamental because it recognizes the distinctly different starting points of every country, and therefore, that full realization of all economic, social, and cultural rights may not be achievable immediately, given constraints on resource availability. Clearly, wealthy societies like Norway, the US, and Japan have vastly more resources for food, health, and education than poor societies like Mali or Laos. 
The progressive realization duty therefore holds richer countries to a higher standard than poorer countries. Those with more are obligated to do more, while the, those with less are obligated to do the best they can with what they've got. Progressive realization also has another meaning. It requires states to move as quickly as possible to realize rights and to use the resources that are available as effectively as they possibly can. However, this, progressive, this principle of progressive realization has long been used as an escape hatch by countries claiming inadequate resources in order to avoid accountability for dismal economic and social rights performance. Without an objective metric indicating how well countries should be performing in terms of rights fulfillment at any given resource level, they can always just argue that they're doing the best that they can, subject to their resource constraints. The SURF index approach allows apples to apples comparisons over time and across similarly situated countries, overcoming the conundrum created by the progressive realization obligation. I turn now to the difficult task, we want to, we want to stay on the difficult task, um, of translating abstract legal norms into indicator sets that reflect the enjoyment of various social and economic rights. Beyond the crucial is issue of concept validity, that is how well an indicator reflects what one seeks to measure, it was important that our indicators be reliable and based on objective information transparent and publicly accessible, intertemporally and internationally comparable, and broad in coverage across countries and over time. In this slide, you can see the indicators that we've selected through a very rigorous process to use for each right. So we, this is the rights, rights to food, percent children under five not malnourished, uh, that's stunting, um, and then for high income OECD countries, percent infants not low birth weight, right to education, uh, primary school completion rate, combined school enrollment rate. For high income OECD countries, combined school enrollment rate, average math and science PISA scores, et cetera. You can see the other uh, indicators that we chose. So a couple things to note. Um, first of all, data limitations prevented us from including the right to social security at this time. Um, we also were not able in some of our variants of the index to include the right to adequate housing. Um, and certainly as data constraints relax, it would be make sense to expand the index to include all six rights. So why were these particular indicators chosen? Um, there's a, many considerations. One is that some indicators are bellwether indicators and that they are relevant to multiple aspects of economic and social rights fulfillment. For example, access to potable water is an underlying determinant of health and nutrition and is related to adequate housing. More importantly, or most importantly really, human rights are concerned with the rights of all people. Therefore, indicators that reflect the proportion of the population that enjoys a given level of well-being are preferred to those reflecting average well-being, which effaces differences between groups. Our book, which we hope you buy, uh, detail, contains a detailed explanation of how and why these specific indicators were selected. As an indicator for available resources in a country, we use GDP per capita, which reflects the total resources available per person. Maximum available resources means total national resources expressed by one delegate during the drafting process as referring to the real resources of the country and not to budgetary appropriations. So now we'll talk about how these indicators are put together to construct the SURF index. We develop an, an innovative achievement possibilities frontier, which reveals the best countries can do in terms of social and economic rights obligations at any given level of resource availability, bringing empirical rigor to the previously slippery legal concept of progressive realization. 
building on the framework of production possibility frontiers, PPFs, long used in economics, achievement possibility frontiers are constructed by plotting the socioeconomic indicator values on the y-axis against the resource availability indicator per capita GDP on the x-axis, and then using the outer boundary of these achievements to identify the achievement possibility frontier. So here we can see a prototype. Just as a PPF shows the maximum of a good possible for a given resource input, the APF reveals how well a country can perform in terms of the level of social and economic rights it can provide at any given level of resource availability. For example, we would not expect Malawi with less than $750 per capita GDP to do as well as Swaziland with more than $6,000 per capita GDP. And this shows that the examples of different indicators, right? We have primary completion and we have access to sanitation. The shape of the frontiers, which differ, reflects the rate at which resources can be feasibly transformed into rights enjoyment. As we can see, some rights can be fully realized at much lower levels of per capita GDP than others. So I want to walk through this construction process using a concrete example, the right to food. After creating the APFs for each of the socioeconomic indicators, scores for each indicator are calculated as an achievement percentage, which reflects how well a country is doing compared to what is possible at any given per capita income level. A country with socioeconomic outcomes at the frontier, this is the frontier, receives 100%. The worst performing country at any income level receives 0%. The first step in, const in constructing con country performance indicator scores is to find actual performance of a country as a percent of feasible performance. Consider India. In India, roughly 61% of children are not stunted, the height of the blue arrow. But given India's per capita income level, it should be able to ensure that 94% of children are not stunted. That's the height of the red arrow, which is the frontier of the APF. India's performance score on this indicator is therefore calculated as the percentage of the distance between the horizontal red line and the frontier. The height of the blue arrow as a percent of the height of the red arrow. In other words, a country's performance in fulfilling its rights obligations is revealed by the distance between actual, actual and feasible, actual and feasible levels of rights enjoyment. We then aggregate the results for the different performance indicators to construct a single rights fulfillment index for each right. Different indicators aggregated, indicator one, indicator two. We created the APFs. We created the performance scores. Did that for both indicators. We create an average, and that's the score for the right. In this case, the score for the right to food. Finally, we aggregate all the rights fulfillment indices into the composite SURF index, which provides a holistic measure of social and economic rights fulfillment. For those who are very math inclined, here is the summary of the methodology. I won't read it for those who are not math inclined. You can read it for yourself. So what does this all mean? How do we interpret it? How do we read it? How do we understand what it is that we have analyzed? Um, first of all, the scores measure the country's achievements relative to what should be feasible to achieve at the country's per capita income level. 
Second, a score of less than 100% means the country is not doing nearly as much as it could given its resource capacity, its GDP per capita. It's not meeting its obligations of result. Third, a score of 100% does not generally imply the right concern is enjoyed by all, rather than it implies that given its resources, the country is doing as well as any other similarly situated country at the same per capita income level. So now I will turn it over to my colleague to discuss what can we learn from the SURF index. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So what does the SURF index reveal? A couple of things. First of all, resource constraints do matter. Resource constraints impinge upon a country's ability to ensure its citizens enjoy very important aspects that improve the quality of their lives. But those resource constraints are less binding at, for different aspects of rights. So for example, if we consider what it takes to get resources sufficient to ensure that all kids can go to primary school, we find that really only an income of about $2,300 per capita is required. On the other hand, if you want to make sure the ability to ensure that all people have access to clean water, that requires a somewhat higher per capita income level, roughly $6,000. However, ensuring that all kids have access to and are able to attend secondary school really is only something that so far high income countries have been able to achieve. It takes a higher level of resources in our uh, example, in, in our work so far, about uh, $29,000 per capita. So that's really a high income level issue. So although there are different achievement possibilities for countries on different aspects of different rights, the fact of the matter remains that there is widely differing performance of countries at any and every per capita income level. So let's look at this chart right here. I have the resource measure at the bottom on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, I have our SERP index. You see a bar at the top there going across here. That would be a score of 100% on the SURF index. Let's take a look at country performance. We see, for example, at the same per capita income level that India has, we see that Moldova does dramatically better, and Guyana does significantly better, but not nearly as well as Moldova. Now let's say we increase our per capita income. Again, we see the same pattern. Here we see Angola barely achieves 40% of what should be feasible, while Jordan achieves roughly 90%. And this occurs throughout the income range. We have Gabon at just barely over 45% occupying the worst performance, and Uruguay the best. And even when we get out to the highest per capita income levels, we see some outliers that are performing exceptionally poorly. Has there been progress over time? Remember, this is one of the things that is required under progressive realization, that not only countries do the best they can with the resources they have, but that there is improvement over time. This is the trend across the different rights for our core index. And as you can see, the greatest progress has been with regard to the right to education. That's the green trend line right there. The least progress has been made with regard to the right to work, although that's the uh, uh, aspect, the right, that um, countries were doing the best on 30 or 40 years ago. This is actually from a separate historical study looking over time at uh, what rights enjoyments levels were. The other thing to notice is that there has actually been conversion amongst low and middle income countries primarily. If we look at the pattern for high income countries, it's somewhat different. Education is the same. We see the most rapid progress along that dimension for that right. However, there have been increasing difficulties with ensuring the right to work, and that's the blue trend line there. Now, these are trends. These are averages across all countries for which we can calculate the index. But in fact, there is wide variation across countries. And it's important to look at this for each and every country separately. Many countries, as you can observe from this graph, and this is high income countries, have actually experienced retrogression. That is, their incomes may have grown, OK? And they, those increases in incomes didn't improve anybody's lives any better, okay, or accrued to only a very small proportion of the population. 
or it could be that simply the level of enjoyment of rights deteriorated at the same per capita income level. There could be many different explanations, but the fact of the matter is that some countries have not succeeded in ensuring that rights enjoyment increases over time. The simple fact of the matter is that rights remain unfulfilled, unnecessarily unfulfilled, for many people throughout the globe. Now, what I've done here is I've plotted the SURF index scores using our core uh, SURF index. This is for basically low and middle income countries. And what you can see is if we look at this line of about, let's say, 75% right about here, okay, a, in other words, achieving only 75% of what they should be able to, we see nonetheless that about, sort of judging from the width of that, those bands, about 60% of countries aren't even doing 75% of what they should be able to do. The SURF index is actually quite flexible. And we've been able to undertake quite a number of analyses at the subnational level. And that has revealed a number of interesting findings. One of the studies we did, we did considered the right to food in India. And our basic question was, is it the case that ensuring the right to food is primarily an issue of food production, or is something else going on? People can actually achieve the right to food through three primary channels. The first channel is through own production, okay, whatever assets they have to produce food with. A second channel we call in change exchange entitlements. That is, they could, for example, sell their labor in exchange to purchase food. That's a very common channel used. Or there could be social entitlements. Okay? So those are the three primary channels. So here we're looking at production entitlements. And what we did is we computed the right to, school, to food score across all 29 of India's states. Here I've just shown a few of those states. And you notice that there's a tremendous range across states in the extent to which those states are fulfilling the right to food. We have Kerala at the top fulfilling 77%. Could be better, OK, but that's the top score for it, India there. And we saw India overall is not doing that well. And we saw Uttar Pradesh, however, only 17% are achieving, they're only achieving 17% of what they could. A lot more kids could be well nourished, all right? Now, how does this relate to food production? We also computed for each of these states the per capita food production. And what we found was that Punjab produces the most food, okay, per capita, yet its score is only 51%. Okay? Uttar Pradesh, produces 10 times more food than either Kerala or Tamil Nadu, yet its score is at the bottom. So clearly the conclusion here is that it's not just a matter of production. Okay? It's a matter that, of ensuring that people have ways to access that production. And that has to do with exchange entitlements and social <coughs> entitlements as well, or assets from which they can produce the food themselves. Now, we also did a study of the United States. The United States has wonderfully rich data, so this enabled us to use a richer array of um, indicators in terms of measuring right enjoyment. And you notice I sort of uh, added in Kentucky there just for a little context that you all might be interested in. But um, what this first slide shows is it shows for the SURF index as a whole and then for each of the underlying rights, the right to food, education, health, work, and housing, and social security, which we can compute for the United States, we find that there is quite a large range in terms of how well countries score. So for example, if we're looking at the SURF index as a whole, Louisiana does the worst, and North Dakota does the best. If we're talking about the right to housing, we notice that California wins the booby prize there by a long shot, OK? And in terms of the right to work, Connecticut, my state, does worse, OK? Maine actually does surprisingly well, doing the best on the right to education and the right to social security. Now, the thinking of states 
do not track per capita income levels. And you can, for example, see that very clearly for Kentucky, where I've given you its score uh, overall on the SURF index and for each right. And I've also given you its rank. Notice that in terms of per capita income, Kentucky scored at the time the study was done 42nd. And yet, when you talked about the, um, uh, its score on, for example, the right to education, it does much, much better. It scores at the 20, 21, rank number 21 across all US states. All right, the other thing that we were able to do is we were able to disaggregate the SURF scores by state and by race, okay? So we computed the scores for all the different rights here for whites alone, okay? For blacks alone and for Hispanics alone. And what we found is, to my mind, not terribly surprising, but nonetheless terribly shocking. What we have here, for example, is for whites, we see that the lowest score for whites was in Nevada of 84.9, and the highest score was Maryland, okay? Kentucky's score was just above the bottom there, okay? But for blacks, we see a different set of ranges. In this case, 60 was the lowest one in Missouri, 74 was the highest one in Maryland, and so on, okay? If you look at that table, the somewhat shocking revelation is that the lowest score in any state for whites is higher than the highest score in any states for the most marginalized group, blacks or Hispanics, okay? So it really does point out stark differences. So these. And, and it also shows that the differences, by disaggregating it by state, the differences across states and scores are not just a result of different racial compositions. There's problems throughout the states. Okay. All right, so we've looked at some of the results of what we can see the problems are, the extent of the problems, et cetera. But really, the question we need to ask is, how can we improve things? What matters for strong performance? And so we've looked at a couple of things here. There's much, much more to be done. So what I want to do is just highlight a couple of our findings here. All right. So one of the big questions we might raise is if we think about focusing our energies on fulfilling rights, does that mean that we're not going to be able to grow our resources so that we can further improve our rights in the future? Right? So this was a question we had. Really, that's asking, is there a short-term, long-term trade-off in terms of fulfilling social and economic rights? Should you focus on growth first and then use that higher level of resources to ensure rights? Or right from the get-go, should you focus on ensuring economic and social rights? Okay, so we undertook, that was one question. A second question we had is, are there any policies that states have? Can we identify states? or countries that have succeeded in doing well on both growth and fulfilling economic and social rights. So that was sort of the set of questions we set out with this analysis for. And the way we did it was we, for two separate decades, and again, this was using our historical data series, so we did it for the decade of the 90s and the decade of the 2000s. We split for each of those decades the countries in two ways. First, we looked at the SURF score, and we divided countries into above the median SURF score and below the median SURF score, okay? And then we also divided the same set of countries for each decade into below median GDP growth and above median GDP growth, okay? And then what we're going to look at is we're going to assign countries to different cells, okay? So some countries started out in a decade of, uh, called midpoint, 1995, with um, above medium surf and below medium GDP growth, okay? We have a whole set there, and we're gonna see what happens to that set of countries in the next decade. Which quadrant do they end up? Do they stay here, do they go here, do they go here, do they go here, et cetera? So again, we'll have some countries starting out in the virtuous, what happens to them, what happens that started out to the high growth, but low human rights, et cetera. All right, so that's where I'm going now. So let's take a look first at the growth lopsided. Growth lopsided are countries that have high growth, okay, but low social and economic rights fulfillment, all right? So for that set of countries, we found that in the next decade, 44% stayed there, okay? 
Another 44%, however, transitioned to what we call the vicious category, low growth, low human rights fulfillment. Another 6% actually made it to the virtuous category, and the final 6% made it to the surf lopsided. So that doesn't look very promising for following a growth first strategy. Let's see what happens with some of the other initial starting points, though. What are the transition patterns? So let's say if you start in the vicious category, OK? It's hard to get out of. 67% stayed there, all right? Another thing did manage to get into the surf lopsided. So they'd at least improved, even though slow growth, they improved, right, improved rights enjoyment. Some went to the growth lopsided, a similar number, and none made it to the virtuous, OK? What about those that started in the surf lopsided category? 25% remained, but a whopping 68% made it into the virtuous category. There were a few that ended up vicious and none that ended up growth lopsided. What if you started out in the virtuous? If you could get there, you had a reasonable chance of staying there. 46% remained. 31% transited to surf lopsided from which there was a pretty good chance of going back up to the, uh, the virtuous one. And 15 did go to vicious and another 8 to growth lopsided. Okay, so this exercise was initially done for countries uh, just across two decades and just using the whole surf index. We then later did it for each of the individual rights and we did it across three separate decade transitional patterns. The results held up. Okay, the results are basically that if you want to end up in a, uh, have the best shot of ending up with high growth and human rights fulfillment, okay, high growth and high quality of life, your best strategy is actually to focus initially on improving human rights and that eventually can translate into rapid growth. Now that's not terribly surprising if you think of what we're talking about. Healthy individuals that are well educated tend to be more productive. So, you know, it may not be what we initially think of, but actually it's not terribly counterintuitive. All right, some other things we might want to ask. Are high government expenditures necessary? Okay. It could be that certain rights can more readily be fulfilled through the marketplace or through exchange entitlements, we would say, in our terminology. Okay? But it also may be that some other rights may more readily be filled through social entitlements or government provision types of things. And there's a big question, are there certain rights where we really need a large government? One of the rights that has often been pointed out and is part of the U.S. debate today is perhaps we need to put the health care system to a larger extent in government provision, so social entitlements sort of arrangement, okay? And many countries do have that. So we wanted to look at it across countries. And so what we did is we did some correlations, and here I have some patterns for, for you. Here's the score on the right to health index. And here's public expenditure as a percent of GDP. When we did it as a uh, per capita, it, we found no relationship. When we first did it as a percent of GDP, we initially found a slight upward slope. Okay? But when we abstracted from the need based on things like malaria indemnity, et cetera, then that relationship basically disappeared and was no longer statistically significant. So in other words, you don't have to have a large government to have good health outcomes, okay? In fact, we were able to appoint at a number of countries that had high health expenditures and good health outcomes, and an equal number of countries that had lo uh, high, high, good health outcomes but low expenditures as a percent of GDP. Okay. Another question, does gender equality matter? Very much. Okay, this was one of the strongest relationships we found actually. And we used a number of different indicators of gender equality. And I've just shown you here the two um, most common ones that are used. And one is a gender equality index put out by Social Watch. And we looked at the surf scores on the vertical axis and the gender equality, so to the right is greater equality and we looked at how that correlated. There was a strong positive correlation. Okay, in other words, the greater gender equality, the higher your surf score. OK? 
identify. Not surprisingly, we also looked at the UN GDP uh, gender inequality index, and the conclusion's the same, even though the graph goes in opposite directions. In one case, we're looking at equality, the other inequality. And here we see the lower gender inequality, the higher the SURF score. Okay, so gender equality matters. Now, we can talk about some of the reasons why that might be the case, but it has a lot to do with the expenditure patterns of women over men and a number of other factors. Another thing that we might raise is, is it important to be a democracy in order to ensure economic and social rights? Okay? And there have been a number of studies looking at that question with regard to political and civil rights, but very few with regard to economic and social rights. Okay, so we decided to undertake one of those. And our indicator of sort of the degree of democracy was the polity. Uh, indicator. I, some of you may have heard that, some of you may not. Of it. It's not terribly important here. Um, but that's the one we used. And the first quintile is those that have the most autocratic governments. And the fifth quintile is those that have the most democratic governments. And what we've shown here is the range of scores found in countries that are the most autocratic. And you can see it goes from a very low surf score to quite a high surf score. Okay? And what was interesting about this pattern is that the more democratic a country was, the better it protected itself from very bad outcomes. Okay? In other words, autocratic governments could do quite well, but there was a risk that they do really badly. Okay? Democratic countries could do quite well, and there wasn't nearly the risk that they would do really badly. Okay? So democracy helps, democracy helps in that sense. It's not going to guarantee you the best outcome, though. Okay? Another thing we wondered was whether it's important to um, put legal commitments in place. Okay? I mean, if it's not important, then we shouldn't be focusing so much time and energy on putting these laws in place. That's an expensive proposition. We could spend our resources better otherwise. So what we looked at here is this is a, uh, uh, indicated the TIESR, I, I never know how to pronounce it, TESER uh, index, that is actually looking at the extent to which the different economic, social, and cultural rights have been embedded into domestic law. And they identify two kinds of uh, categories here is how we've grouped them. And the red ones are citizens that have legal recourse for the relevant rights. It's not only in law, but citizens can sue and they can get some sort of compensation. And then the blue is those where either the right is, has not been uh, put into law or the um, laws are non-binding. That is, you, you have no recourse. And as you can see, across all of the rights, the red bar is higher, indicating that rights are more likely to improve in those countries that actually have legal commitments that are binding in place. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Sakiko for a little bit of a case study, something that's been done beyond our book. So I'm just going to give you an illustration of where we can take some of these findings. Um, as Susan showed, um, right to food on the left uh, is, a, is a right where the fact of having a legal uh, guarantee um, makes some difference, but compared with some of the others, maybe not very much. So I compared South, South Africa and Brazil uh, in terms of their performance um, in guaranteeing the right to food. So you see that these are countries with similar levels of income, but have very different levels of surf uh, measured performance. Um, the composite index uh, for uh, South Africa is 61.5, for Brazil is 87.4. For food, it is 61.7 for South Africa com compared with 91.1 for, um, uh, for, for Brazil. And in, in many respects, this is surprising uh, because South Africa is known for its very robust constitution. It is considered to be one of the, the, the strongest constitutions in the world that um, uh, incorporates the, the right to food. There's also a very strong political commitment 
with the transition to democracy in 1994, um, there was a very strong commitment that democracy and freedom meant not just the, all of the uh, freedom from, non, from discrimination, the racial discrimination, but that, the, that, that all people would have equal opportunities and access to these uh, social economic rights. But um, uh, these, um, moreover, not only do, does the, the country have um, these commitments, uh, they have also uh, been a, um, a forerunner in using the judicial system to enforce these rights. Uh, there is also a very strong civil society. Uh, and yet, you have these very uh, poor outcomes. And the country does not do well in translating these, the, the resources they have uh, in securing the right to food. And when you look at their policy measures, in fact, it's not very difficult to understand why uh, Brazil does so much better. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, well, maybe I should show you the Brazil uh, Brazil um, policy um, uh, framework that um, Brazil, I think, has an extraordinary um, uh, program called Forma Zero that was launched uh, in 2004 by former President Lula as a signature program. And, and the point is that this is a very multi-sectorial, multi-dimensional uh, program that gets at all of the three dimensions, the entitlements to food that Susan mentioned earlier, through production, through purchase and exchange in the market, and therefore you have to have the income, or through some sort of a social transfer, a social safety net in case you have no means of production nor, means, uh, nor the income to purchase food. And so they have, um, a program that is, has about 26 different components that is spread across many different ministries. And the point about something like the right to food is that it is not a single sector issue. You have to deal with agricultural production. You have to deal with education and nutrition. You have to deal with markets. So they had a program, for example, where public institutions like schools and hospitals would procure from small-scale farmers giving the small-scale farmers access to markets that they would otherwise find difficult to negotiate. So there was a very comprehensive idea. Um, and so, but then the South African government tried, had this rhetoric of, of, uh, of right to food, and yet their policy was very much focused on production and based on the Ministry of Agriculture's uh, activities and not really very uh, proactively focused on small-scale farming. And, but their entire sort of um, uh, philosophy was to, to not intervene. So when there was a food crisis with huge spikes, uh, something like 35% increase in the price of maize, which is the staple food, the Minister of Finance said, you know, public policy responses to rising prices should focus on two main areas, income support to the most vulnerable and efforts to increase production. Price controls are likely to work in the short term, but they are, unlike, they are likely to impact negatively on the supply response resulting in higher prices in the future. Rising prices impose an increased burden on the poor. It is correct the government acts to intervene in the interests of the poor to ensure that the poorest of the poor are able to survive. More importantly, it is also important for our communities to get organized to produce some of their own food. So this is sort of saying, well, you know, if you're poor and you see rising prices, just go and produce your own food. And because in the long term, you just want to get the market to respond. So there was not, not this kind of proactive intervention um, to deal with this, this crisis. And I just want to, illust to, to give you this illustration to point out how important it is to understand that the right to food, and like many other rights, do not depend entirely on government handouts. It depends on a long-term 
um, preparation or long-term interventions to develop a, put in place an enabling environment in which people can access food either through purchase, through production, or some sort of a safety net in case there is, is need. Thank you. Okay, one more thing. Wait, before we're done, we're still trying to show you where we're going with this. Okay, a couple of things I wanted to point out here. And that is we're taking this work to other levels. Part of it is we want to call on all of you to help us out to untie these relationships and understand what really works to promote human flourishing with regard to economic and social rights. And we have two initiatives here that work towards that end. The first one here, the Social and Economic Rights, the Economic and Social Rights Empowerment Initiative. This is one that Tara Sakiko and I initially set up, and I've worked with graduate students and John Stewart, right, sitting right here, to actually increase, uh, to update the data. And you can download data here on the SERP index scores for all countries. We've gone through a number of rounds of updates. You can also get access to a number of the studies that we've produced. We'd love to receive studies from you that we could put up on that website that use this data that you've also produced. We're actually right in the midst of another update, okay? So we hope to have that out probably in, well, within the month, let's say, okay? Then secondly, I co-founded with a colleague in New Zealand, Anne-Marie Brooke, and a colleague at the University of Georgia, Chad Clay, the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, and this is where we're taking the index to the advocacy community. And you can see, you can actually click on either of these, or it's humanrightsmeasurement.org, and here it's surfindex.org, but for the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, just Google humanrightsmeasurement.org. And what we've attempted to do is to take this information, take this data, and put them in a uh, manner that is, uh, more suited for advocacy. And such, so we've done a lot of work with data visualization. Uh, the approach we've been using is a co-design approach. So we've had a number of conferences where we brought in uh, people that are on the, on the um, front lines of fighting to improve rights. Uh, people from Human Rights Watch, people from Amnesty, but much more importantly, people from many of the very small organizations in countries throughout the globe and to get their input to help us figure out what kinds of advocacy materials we can produce for them that will make their roles or their efforts more effective. So that's where we are and we hope to keep going and making this uh, index that we've developed actually improve people's lives. Thanks. Yes, I see a question there. How many there. Uh, I think maybe the best thing is if we take a few questions at a time. Okay. Is there any other questions? Yes? Uh, I wondered if the uh, Gini index or income distribution was a factor in your analysis. <coughs> do you want to take this? Uh, in terms of the, how did the United States do? It's going to depend a little bit upon which version you're talking about. And the version of the, um, it was the 2012 update of the SURF index that was used in the book. Uh, 2015 was when the book was finished. We hadn't gotten to that one. At that time, it was, I believe, 20th amongst high-income OECD countries. Uh, the in update that we're currently doing, um, this may not be right because we're just now getting out the final results. Okay, but it's scoring roughly, it's, I believe my, my recollection is it was scoring 81% of what should be feasible, and that placed it amongst high-income OECD countries uh, in the bottom quarter. I'm not exactly sure what its rank was. Okay. Second and question the Gini was Gini 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 uh, So your question was why not use that as a measure of resources? I just that would have been one of the things that we looked at in terms of what matters for policy. And we did some initial exercises using the genie, but actually the data on the genie are not as good as you might like 
in the sense yeah. that they aren't available for most countries every year. So we, what we did look is we, we were looking at gender inequality as sort of a way of addressing that issue. I think more work could and should be done using the Gini index or you know, share of income. A lot more data has come out since we did this, and that might be an appropriate way to go. Um, thank you, this is fantastic. Um, one of the particular virtues of the capabilities approach is the attention to the diversity of people's capacity to convert resources into well-being. And I was wondering uh, how you approach that question, uh, rights attainment versus the ability to turn having those rights into well-being in somebody's life. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that's a sort of a common understanding um, of um, human rights and human well-being that resources are converted into human flourishing, not on a one-to-one, -one, but in various ways. We use across countries, and Amartya Sen uses this conversion factor issue to explain that, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with the capabilities theory, uh, that the resources you need to move from here to there would differ from whether you are you know, differently abled and need a wheelchair or whether you can just walk by yourself. Uh, so the, the, the you know, resources do not convert into well-being. But in the specific actual formula, which is, uh, which is using aggregated data, uh, I guess it doesn't necessarily specifically uh, come into play. But I mean, I think the whole notion of the relationship between resources and human well-being is central to the SURF index because the core question of the SURF index is how do countries convert the resources that are available into human flourishing through the, the kinds of social arrangements that are made. Oh, sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, throughout your studies or your research, did you find that there was a correlation at all between free trade and like human rights? I actually looked at that with regard to some of the growth studies we've done, and, and that there's actually a lot more than I showed you that's been done on that thing. Um, some attention to ensuring access to trade was important. That wasn't the key factor, but that was indeed one of the things that tended to be associated with those countries that were getting into the virtuous category. So, and those that were in the vicious category tend to have much more closed trade regimes. <coughs> but it, again, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. It depends upon whether or not you have fair trade as well as trade. <laughs> well, well I, I just want to add here that you can look at something like trade as is this something that would be a facilitator of human rights progress. But you can also look at free trade, uh, not so much, I beg, I beg your pardon, not free trade, but trade agreements. So trade agreements are not the same as the actual ability to trade, and, and the, although they're, they're supposed to be. But the, one of the challenges, I think, for, for today is that increasingly trade agreements are no longer about the flow of goods or services. They are about investment conditions. So, uh, so you have uh, an increasing number of bilateral and plurilateral agreements that have some provisions for things like reducing tariffs and market access, but a large number of provisions for things like government procurement, state-owned industries, and so on. That, and then there is this thing called the <coughs> ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, by which the ability of the state to um, implement public policies that further economic social rights is actually highly constrained. And so this is one of the, the major issues. I mean, for example, intellectual property provisions in the trade agreements started with the TRIPS agreement in the WTO 1994, but an agreement like the 
TPP that the U.S. no longer participates in, but the other 11 countries have agreed to, 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 to go further with, includes much more stringent intellectual property <coughs> provisions that um, could also put a lot more pressure on the difficulty of having wider access to medicines and put pressure on, uh, on medicines prices. So, you know, there is a, and there are these famous cases of how states cannot implement like anti-smoking, plain packaging, uh, smoking uh, warnings on, um, on cigarettes and uh, for, for cigarette packages and they get sued by Philip Morris for doing that. Australia had to go through this. So, I mean, I think that the relationship between investors and the state is something uh, that I think needs to be looked at from the human rights perspective, that trade agreements as, as agreements are actually putting in conditions that have a huge impact on human rights. But then decisions about how to design trade agreements are made by ministers of trade, not by ministers of health. And so you need a human rights impact assessment of these trade agreements. Yes. Some of your findings are kind of, oh, we expected that. Uh, looks like no big surprises there. Oh, some are, yeah, it's worse than I thought. What, what are, what's the most surprising one that you just want to say, we've got to do something about it. Something that surprised you or is or I dramatic? For me, trained as a neoliberal economist in many regards, <laughs> there was always a sense that, you know, growth first is the way to go. That, you know, if you can get growth underway, then everything else will follow. And I think I, I had come to doubt that personally and a lot of my work with income inequality and poverty, but still that was a very strong presumption and still is in my profession. And I, I was quite frankly not surprised that perhaps education showed that, you know, countries that focus on education don't necessarily do so by sacrificing growth, okay? But I was more surprised to learn that it was true for every decade and for every right, that the strength of that relationship, that, that you really, growth first is not the way to go. That in fact, attending to people's needs is gonna get you further in terms of growing your resources in the future was to me perhaps the, the, I don't know if I'll call it shocking, but the more profound discovery, I think. I remember you talking about that. It, it seems to me that and some of your other data is a great recruiting tool for people saying you are, you should spend your life in social economics. <laughs> I mean, if I were younger, I, Appeals, talk appeals to me is I want to enter that field. Great. <laughs> That's what we want to do. <laughs> we need lots of researchers out there figuring these things out and promoting rights. Do you have one more question? Yes, over there. Uh, is it possible to calculate a global uh, search index to see how we humans are performing as a whole? I suppose we could average. <laughs> across countries? I don't know. I would, that would be an interesting question. That would be kind of fun to have sort of a global watch that you could, I could see it on one of our websites, you know, for the activists, <laughs> global watch report card, how, how's the globe doing? <laughs> but I'd love to hear your ideas on that. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out this afternoon.